or give you guys some time over the weekend, Facebook ads have been changing very, very rapidly. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the Facebook ads platform, right? So they keep adding all these integrations, so I want to make sure to give you up-to-date information so that when we do our demo in class on Monday, we're not looking at old stuff that's irrelevant, we're looking at new stuff that's very relevant, okay? So, segmentation tonight. A um, couple things we're going to cover. The first one, who wants to read objective one? Raise your hand, please. Objective one. Understand the importance of segmenting and how to use marketing analytics tools to segment and target customers. Sure. So there were some questions in the survey form about what this idea of segmentation is. When it might be applicable, right? So for a small business owner, you may not be able to get as detailed as far as segmentation with regard to ice cream cone email versus um, catalog type of email, okay? But let me ask you a question. Would we market a message or product to a man, the same you might message it to a woman? You know, more than likely no, it might, maybe, right? Would you market a, or message a product for a dad the same way you would for an uncle? No. Right? Or how about this, a dad for a single male? Okay? So, segmentation, really, for all business owners, um, is usually reinforced with regard to these campaigns that we come up with. Valentine's Day is typically segmenting a population of the audience, all right? I love Valentine's Day. I did not have a significant other this past Valentine's Day. All this, send your loved one flowers, buy her chocolates, that was not aimed towards being a single Day. woman, right? For single people during Valentine's Day, what type of campaign do they usually promote or make popular? It's become Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day, Singles Awareness Day, okay? So that's an example of segmentation, right? Mother's Day, okay? There's so many months throughout the year that we could send our mother's flowers, but in Mother's Day in particular, um, really 1-800-Flowers is targeting everybody who's been born that has a mom, right? In the hopes that you send your mother flowers, okay? So segmentation can be as simple or as complex as you want to make it and as you need to make it for your business. I would say the most valuable tool that segmentation teaches us is that you know, our customers don't necessarily, not all of our customers think the same, behave the same, or act the same. And that's really the key. And for the small business owner, a couple people have alluded to this. You'll have this idea of somebody who becomes a prospect versus somebody who becomes a customer. And those are two really important segments to make sure you're familiar with. Because that prospect you could continually remarket to to convert them to become a customer. And then you have different customer segments. Some are your loyal customers. All right? So we'll get into that. But I just wanted to really clarify this idea of segmentation. Did that help? Yes? Okay. So what is our second objective for tonight then? Who wants to raise your hand? All right, Alfonso. Track customer behavior across multiple Yes. So, what are we able to do with Google Analytics? We're able to see customer behavior, right? How many of you watched all the videos that we posted last Wednesday over the weekend? How many of you still have some videos to watch? You're going to be watching them this weekend because we're moving forward with this, okay? Did you guys hear about this term attribution? I've talked about it in class. We're going to see a little bit more about it tonight. This is the idea of multi-step, okay? Going back to this idea that we saw a couple weeks ago, actually last week, the familiar customer versus the unfamiliar customer. Neither one of those customers went straight to the website. There were some steps that took place. And if we were at an agency and we were spending a lot of money on Facebook ads, or Google Ads, 
we would want to know the steps the customers took to get to the website. You can take or leave this idea of attribution. Google Analytics already assigns what they call last click attribution for you, but I would say it's just a helpful theory to be familiar with if you're going to be a digital marketer. All right, all right, last one, number three. Sarah. Yes, so attribution, like I said, Google automatically gives you this idea of a last click attribution. That means that the very last website or ad or what have you somebody came from to your site, Google says that's how they got there. But as we see with our familiar and unfamiliar customer, we click around and we do a lot of things. So there's something called first click attribution. There's an attribution that says if somebody first clicks on a Google ad, but then they go to your website, but then they go to your Facebook ad, and then they complete a purchase, actually gives credit for each of those steps, okay? So we'll get to that. So reviewing this idea of segmentation and targeting. In the last class, we learned about segmenting your email list. Um, particularly, like I said, with regard to your list consists of men, women, all different ages, all different backgrounds, all different responses. Some more emotionally appealing, some more wanting content that's logically appealing. But segmentation, by definition, means what? Who wants to read the definition for me? Okay, Phil? Cool. Segmentation means to divide the marketplace into parts Yes, profitable. So I like this idea that you know Katie shared with ISO. Okay, her client is trying to go after what segment specifically to start. Remember what she said. What segment? Yes. Teenagers, young kids. Okay, she's not saying we're going to go after everybody. Who, who believes in giving gifts or whatever. They're getting very specific and they're getting specific. Why do they choose that particular demographic to go after? Well, in my business, I actually it for them. Um, they wanted to go after everyone and we explained it would be much more successful, especially with gravitation around the corner, to target the younger crowd first. And then down the road, once we built a solid foundation, start sprinkling in moms and then dads. So graduation means people, whether we have a recession or not, you know, graduation means people are going to be giving a gift or giving money. Therefore, for this business, it would be lucrative for them to focus on that audience because whether whatever happens with the economy, people will still be doing something towards graduation, right? Profitable. Um, who wants to read what targeting or target marketing is? Okay. Targeting your target marketing entails deciding which potential customer segments the company will focus on campaigns and products and services. Yes, yeah. So we've talked about this. Like, um, you can provide multiple services. You can have multiple product lines. All right. And going back to this idea of the biases that we had in Schoology, if a buyer has too many options or too many choices, it becomes very confusing for them. Okay. So you can pick the products and services that you want to feature, and this is why we come up with campaigns. Let me reiterate this, okay? You have the same products and services available to your customers January, February, March, April, if throughout December, okay? If all you did was every month say, I'm providing you with Steadybox, and we're a subscription service to help you manage your diabetes diagnosis in January. February, I'm providing you with Steadybox. After a while, what do you think your customer would do? Tune you out, right? So this idea of creating a campaign says, our inventory might change on a seasonal basis, okay? Our services might not change, but every month, or every quarter, we're going to come up with a campaign, with an idea, with a way to connect to a segment to help move that inventory. All right? 
Um, so let's use Saren's company as an example. It's a bathing suit luxury swimwear line. Okay, if we're using this idea of January through March, what do you think they might do from a campaign standpoint to try to help move luxury swimwear sales? What might an idea or theme be that they talk about? The beach mod, because that's when you start having like work out to get bathing suits. Okay, prepare. <laughs> prepare for your beach bod or what have you. We just say right here. All right, prepare for spring break. You one know what I mean? A lot of people in New York and that go so on vacations like JetBlue to random islands during that time. Period. Sure, snowbirds. This is where we're going with this. Now from April, May, and June, what might we say if we're all, as the digital ninja, digital ninja agency, this is our client trying to help them set up some campaigns to move their swimwear product. What might we change the topic to be? If January through March was snowbirds and get ready for your pre-spring bod, what might April through June be? Summer, Summer right? You're beach ready. Are we changing the swimwear? We might introduce one or two new pieces, but for a small business, you can't just go make, manufacturing all this new product, right? So that's our point, okay? That's how your campaigns get targeted and segmented, okay? Segmentation always comes before targeting because it helps a company be more selective about who they are marketing their products to. More personal messaging. I love the example you gave us too, Bala, with regard to who you're lending loans to. A lot of people, want to borrow money, but her specific segment was what? The ones that have your credit or are Yes, yes, okay. So segmentation always comes before targeting. So because they've identified that segment, now when they go out and actually try to advertise to them or create copy on their website, are they going to do that with those people in mind? Yes, okay. Segmentation and targeting are equally important for ensuring the overall success of a company. We'd all agree, right? Okay. So I'm going to try to break this down for you guys in layman's terms. Um, there are three main approaches to market segmentation. Fun Latin term here, a priori segmentation is the simplest approach. It's using a classification scheme based on publicly available characteristics. An example would be a client comes from a particular industry. Or if we have a B2B um, service that we're looking for a company that has 100 or more employees, okay? We're able to create a distinct group of customers within that market. Now, however, a priori market segmentation may not always be valid since companies in the same industry and the same uh, size could have very different needs, all right? So let's break this down. We've got a contractor in Los Angeles, all right, so their industry, if they're a contractor and they're actually working on building homes, hotels, and all that, what industry is that? Construction. Yes, construction. Both companies have an employee base of 100 employees, okay? One is looking for more customers. One is looking to actually attract more employees. Are their needs as far as marketing the same? Right? That's what we're talking about here. Is that clear? Okay. Needs-based segmentation is based on differentiated, validated needs that customers express for a specific product or service being offered. The needs are discovered and verified through primary market research, and segments are demarketed based on those different needs rather than the characteristics such as industry size or company size. Let me break this down for your layman's charts. You saw Hizzy, right? And we said, Hizzy will help you see the past, present, and future of any home. Okay? Hizzy was for, tell us again, homeowners, those looking to remodel their home. All right? Um, what was one other thing that we mentioned in there? Or buying and selling their home. Okay? Buying and selling your home is a different need than remodeling your home. Right? Why? When you're selling your home, what do, you, what do you think the need that's driving um, that actual action could be? I'm trying to make it all. Right? When you're remodeling your home, what might be the need that's causing you to remodel? Improvement, okay? Functionality. Sure. Increase your value, okay? 
But these are two different needs-based things. That's what I'm trying to communicate, all right? Last but not least, value-based segmentation. We had an example of this. Value-based segmentation differentiates customers by their economic value. Grouping customers with the same value level into individual segments that can be distinctly targeted. I believe it was our first or second class. We looked at a couple of what types of brands or stores. Who remembers the product? Okay. Who was our luxury shoe company? Right? Who was our more eco economical? Right? So this is value-based segmentation. All right? One is luxury. One is more economical. All right? Differentiates customers by their economic value. Grouping customers with the same value into individual segments that can be distinctly targeted. All right? So, what does this have to do with spaghetti sauce? You're going to find out. Who's familiar with Malcolm Gladwell? Okay, he's the author of several books, The Tipping Point, Outliers, really phenomenal public speaker. Let's see what this has to do with spaghetti sauce. This is so good. Okay. It's gonna make me hungry. I'm gonna go kill my head. Alex, can you help me? Oh, make it pulls wrong. There you go. I think I'm supposed to talk about my new book, which um, is out there and it's about to snap judgments and first impressions. It comes out in January, I hope you won't buy the certificate. Um, but I was thinking about this and I realized that, my, um, that although my new book makes me happy and um, I think will make my mother happy, it's not really about happiness. Uh, so I decided instead um, I would talk about someone who I think has done as much to make Americans happy um, as perhaps anyone for the last uh, 20 years. I met who is a great personal um, someone by the name of Howard Moskowitz, who is most famous for reinventing spaghetti sauce. Um, Howard is uh, Howard's like this high, and he's brown, and he's uh, in his 60s, and he has big, huge glasses and thinning gray hair, and he has a kind of wonderful exuberance and vitality. He's a, he's a parrot and loves the opera and he's a great aficionado of, of uh, medieval history. And he, uh, by profession, he's a psychophysicist. Now, I should tell you that I have no idea what um, psychophysics is, although at some point in my life, I did a girl for two years who was getting her doctorate in psychophysics. Um, I should tell you something about that relationship. But <laughs> Howard, as far as I know, psychophysics is about measuring things. Uh, and Howard is very interested in measuring things. And he graduated with his doctor from Harvard and he set up a consulting shop in um, White Plains, New York. And one of his first clients was, this is many years ago, back in the early 70s, one of his first clients was Patsy. Patsy came to Howard and they said, you know, we, there's this new thing called aspartame, and we'd like to make diet Pepsi. We'd like you to figure out how much aspartame we should put in each can of diet Pepsi in order to have a perfect drink. Now that sounds like an incredibly straightforward question to answer. And that's what Howard thought. Because Pepsi told him, look, we're working with a band between 8 and 12 percent. Anything below 8 percent sweetness is not sweet enough. Anything above 12 percent sweetness is too sweet. We want to know what's the sweet spot between 8 and 12. Now, if I gave you this problem to do, you would all say it's very simple. What we do is we make a, a big experimental batch of Pepsi at every Degree of sweetness, 8%, 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, all the way up to 12. And we try this out with thousands of people, and we plot the results on a curve, and we take the most popular in concentration, right? Really simple. Howard does the experiment, he gets the data back, and he plots on a curve, and all of a sudden he realizes it's not a nice value. In fact, the data doesn't make any sense. It's a mess. It's all over the place. Now, most people in that business, in the world of testing food, and such are not dismayed when the data comes back a mess. They think, you know, you know, figuring out what people think about code is not that easy. You know, maybe we made an error somewhere along the way. You know, let's just take an educated guess and they simply point and they go for 10%. Right? 
Howard is not so easily located. Howard is a man of a certain degree of intellectual standards. And this is not good enough for him. I think this question bedeviled him for years. And you think it do and you'd say, what was wrong? Why could we not make sense of this experiment with bad Pepsi? And one day he was sitting in a diner in White Plains, about to go try to do up some work for Nescafe. And suddenly, like a bolt of lightning, the answer came to him. And that is that when they analyzed that Pepsi data, they were asking the wrong question. They were looking for the perfect Pepsi, and they should have been looking for the perfect Pepsis. Trust me, this was an enormous challenge. This was one of the most brilliant breakthroughs in all of food science. And Howard immediately went on the road, and he would go to conferences around the country, and he would stand up and he would say, you have been looking for the perfect Pepsi. You're wrong. You should be looking for the perfect Pepsi. People would look at him with a blank look, and they would say, what are you talking about? It's craziness. And they would say, you know, move next. Trying to get business, nobody would hire him. He was obsessed, though. He talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. Howard loves the Yiddish expression, to a worm in horseradish, the world is horseradish. This was his horseradish. <laughs> he was obsessed with it. And finally, he had a breakthrough. A glass of pickles came to him. And they said, Mr. Moskowitz, Dr. Moskowitz, we want to make the perfect pickle. And he said, there is no perfect pickle. There are only perfect pickles. And he came back to them and he said, you don't just need to improve your regular. You need to create zesty. That's where we got zesty pickles. Then the next person came to him, and that was Campbell's Soup. This is even more important. In fact, Campbell's Soup is where Howard made his reputation. Campbell's made Prego. And Prego in the early 80s was struggling next to ragu, which was the dominant spaghetti sauce of the 70s and 80s. Now, in the industry, I don't know whether you care about this or how much time I have to go into this, but it was, technically speaking, aside, Prego is a better tomato sauce than ragu. The quality of the tomato base is much better, the spice, spice mix is far superior, it adheres to the pasta in a much more pleasing way. In fact, they would do the famous bowl test back in the 70s with, with ragu and Prego. You'd have a plate of spaghetti and you would pour it on, right? and the ragu would all go to the bottom, and the prego would sit on top. That's called adherence. And anyway, despite the fact that they were far superior in adherence and the quality of their tomato paste, prego was struggling. So they came to Howard and they said, fix this. And Howard looked at their product line and he said, what you have is a dead potato society. A dead tomato society. So he said, this is what I want to do. And he got together with the Campbell Soup Kitchen and he made 45 varieties of spaghetti sauce. And he varied them according to every conceivable way that you could vary tomato sauce. By sweetness, by level of garlic, by tartness, by sourness, by tomatoiness, by invisible solids, my favorite term in this <laughs> spaghetti sauce business. Every conceivable way you could vary spaghetti sauce, he varied spaghetti sauce. And then he took this whole wrap of 45 spaghetti sauces and he went on the road. He went to New York, he went to Chicago, he went to Jacksonville, he went to Los Angeles. And he brought in people by the truckload, the big halls. And he sat them down for two hours and he gave them over the course of that two hours ten bowls. Ten small bowls of pasta with a different spaghetti sauce on each one. And after they ate each bowl, they were able to rate from zero to one hundred how good they thought the spaghetti sauce was. At the end of that process, after doing it for months and months, he had a map in the data about how the American people feel about spaghetti sauce. And then he analyzed the data. Now, did he look for the most popular brand variety of spaghetti sauce? No. Howard doesn't believe that there is such a thing. Instead, he looked at the data and he said, let's see if we can group these different, all these different data points into clusters. Let's see if they congregate around certain ideas. And sure enough, if you sit down and you would analyze these all this data on spaghetti sauce, you realize that all Americans fall into one of three groups. There are people who like their spaghetti sauce plain, there are people who like their spaghetti sauce spicy, and there are people who like it extra chunky. And of those three facts, the third one was the most significant. Because at the time, in the early 1980s, if you went to a supermarket, you would not find extra chunky spaghetti sauce. And Prego turned to Harvard and they said, you're telling me that one third of Americans crave extra chunky spaghetti sauce, and yet no one is servicing their needs? And he said, yes. 
I tried to then went back and completely reformulated the spaghetti sauce and came out with a lot of extra chunky that immediately and completely took over the spaghetti sauce business in this country. And over the next 10 years, they made $600 million off their line of extra chunky sauces. And everyone else in the industry looked at what Howard had done and they said, oh my God, we've been thinking all along. And that's when you start to get seven different kinds of vinegar, 14 different kinds of, of mustard and 71 different kinds of olive oil. And eventually even ragu. I don't know how now did the exact same thing for ragu that he did for Prego. Today, if you go to the supermarket, a really good one, you look at how many ragus there are. Do you know how many are? 36. In six varieties. Cheese, light, robusta, rich and hearty, old world traditional, extra chunky garden. <laughs> That's Howard's doing. That is Howard's gift to the American people. Now, why is that important? <laughs> it is, in fact, enormously important. I'll explain to you why. Because what Howard did is he fundamentally changed the way the food industry thinks about making you happy. Assumption number one in the food industry used to be that the way to find out what people want to eat, what will make people happy, is to ask them. And for years and years and years and years, Ragu and Prego would have focus groups, and they would sit all you people down and they would say, what do you want in a spaghetti sauce? Tell us what you want in a spaghetti sauce. And for all those years, 20, 30 years, through all those folks group sessions, no one ever said they wanted extra chunky. Even though at least a third of them deep in their hearts actually did. <laughs> People don't know what they want. As Howard loves to say, the mind knows not what the tongue wants. It's a mystery. An important, an critically important step in understanding our own desires and tastes is to realize that we cannot always explain what we want. If I asked all of you, for example, in this room, what you want in a coffee, you know what you'd say? Every one of you would say, I want a dark, rich, hearty roast. So people always say, when you ask them, they want a coffee, what do you like? Dark, rich, hearty roast? What percentage of you actually like a dark, rich, hearty roast? According to Howard, somewhere between 25 and 27 percent. Most of you like milky, wheat coffee. <laughs> but you will never, ever say to someone who asks you what you want that I want a milky, wheat coffee. <laughs> so that's number one thing that Howard did. Number two thing that Howard did is he, he made us realize, it's another very good point. He made us realize in the importance of what he likes to call horizontal segmentation. Why is this critical? It's critical because this is the way the food industry thought for Howard. What were they obsessed with in the early years? They were obsessed with mustard. In particular, they were obsessed with the story of Britain. Right? Used to be, there were two mustards, Frenchies and Golds. What were they? Yellow mustard. What's in yellow mustard? Yellow mustard seems too rare in paprika. That was mustard. Great and Paul came along with a Dijon. Right? Much more of uh, olive brown mustard seed, some white wine, nose hit, much more delicate aromatics. But what did they do? They put in a little tiny glass jar. Wonderful enamel flavor on it. Made it look French, even though it's made in Boston or California. <laughs> and instead of charging a dollar fifty for the eight ounce. Can the way the red ounce bottle, the way the French and Golden State, they decided to charge four dollars. And then they had those ads, right, with the guy in the Rolls Royce, and he's eating the Great Coupon, and the other Rolls Royce pulls up and he says, Do you have the Great Coupon? And the whole thing, after they did that, Great Coupon takes off, takes over the mustard business. And everyone's take home lesson from that was that the way to get to make people happy is to give them something that is more expensive, something to aspire to is to make them turn their back on what they like, think they like now and reach out for something higher up the mustard hierarchy. A better mustard, a more expensive mustard, a mustard of more sophistication and culture. And Howard looked at that and said, that's wrong. Mustard does not exist on a hierarchy. Mustard exists just like tomato sauce on a horizontal plane. There's no good mustard or bad mustard. There's no perfect mustard or imperfect mustard. There are only different kinds of mustards that suit different kinds of people. He fundamentally democratized the way we think about taste. And for that as well, we owe Howard Moskowitz a huge vote of thanks. Third thing that Howard did, and perhaps the most important, 
is how it confronted the notion of the platonic dish. What do I mean by that? For the longest time in the food industry, there was a sense that there was one way, a perfect way, to make a dish. You go to Chez Denise, they give you the red tail sashimi with roasted pumpkin seeds and a something something reduction. They don't give you five options on the reduction, right? They don't say, do you want the extra chunky reduction or do you want the. No, you just get the reduction. Why? Because the chef at Chez Denise has a platonic notion about red tail sashimi. This is the way it ought to be. And when that, you know, and she serves it that way time and time again, and if you quarrel with her, she will say, you know what, you're wrong. This is the best way I'll be in this Now that same idea fueled the commercial food industry as well. They had a notion, a platonic notion of what tomato sauce was. And where did that come from? It came from Italy. Italian tomato sauce is what? It's blended, it's thin. The culture of tomato sauce was thin. When we talked about authentic tomato sauce in the 1970s, we talked about Italian tomato sauce, we talked about the earliest ragouts, which had no movable solids, right? These were thin, you just put a little bit over there and it sucked down to the bottom of the pasta. That's what it was. And why were we attached to that? Because we thought that what it took to make people happy was to provide them with the most culturally authentic tomato sauce. Okay? And B, we thought that if we gave them the culturally authentic tomato sauce, then they would embrace it. And that's what would please the maximum number of people. And, how, and the reason we thought that, in other words, people in the cooking world were looking for cooking universes. They were looking for one way to treat all of us. And it's a good reason for them to be obsessed with the idea of universes, because all of science, through the 19th century and much of the 20th, was obsessed with universes. Psychologists, medical scientists, economics, and economists were all interested in finding out the rules that govern the way all of us behave. But that changed, right? That's, what is the great revolution in science of the last 10, 15 years? It is the movement from the search for universals to the understanding of variability. Now in medical science, we don't want to know how necessarily, just how cancer works. We want to know how your cancer is different from my cancer. It is. We're interested in genetics has opened the door to the study of human variability. What Howard Moskowitz was doing was saying this same revolution needs to happen in the world of tomato sauce. And for that, we owe him great folks. Thanks. I'll give you one last illustration of variability. And that is, and, oh, I'm sorry. Howard not only believed that, but he took it the second step, which was to say that when we pursue universal principles in food, we aren't just making an error, we are actually doing ourselves a massive disservice. An example he used was coffee. And coffee is uh, something he did a lot of work with in this debate. If I were to ask all of you to try and come up with a brand of coffee, type of coffee, brew, that made all of you happy, and then I asked you to rate that coffee, the average score in this room for coffee would be about 60 on scale, zero to 100. If, however, you allowed me to break you into plus coffee clusters, maybe three or four coffee clusters, and I could make coffee just for one of those, for each of those individual clusters, your scores would go from 60 to 75 or 70 years. The difference between coffee at 60 and coffee at 78 is the difference between coffee that makes you wince and coffee that makes you deliriously happy. That is the final, and I think, most beautiful lesson of Howard Moskowitz, that in embracing the diversity human beings, we will find a sure way to true happiness. Okay, so something that makes this applicable to our current day and age, all right? How many of you by show of hands actually have an iPhone? Okay. Um, how many different colors do iPhones come in? Probably. Right? Three, four, okay. Colors, right? So, does it matter on a functionality level what color the actual iPhone is? No, right? The white versus the rose gold versus the silver versus the black, it'll all work the same. But why do you think people go so crazy for getting a specific color iPhone? What else? Do I identify with it? Okay. 
spend something about them, like it's personalized. Yes. Yes. So how many of you have a rose gold iPhone? How many of you have a white iPhone? How many of you have a gold iPhone? Okay. How many of you have a black iPhone? All right. So segments, right? Um, Sarah, do you have the gold, the rose gold? Yeah. What made you get the rose gold one as opposed to the gold one? Yeah. Yeah. Something different. Not gonna lie, when iPhone rolled out this new color, it was like, oh, we have an exclusive amount. And I never do that, I never buy into that. But I was like, oh, that'd be kind of cool to get one of the first ones, I'm not gonna lie, all right? Grace, when you got your gold one, what was like that differentiating factor for you? Um, it's kind of chosen color. We didn't really have yeah, like the way it looked. So it was like different enough, right? So I love the video. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. I was just, it's funny because you go through all of that to go, okay, what color iPhone do I want? And then you put a case around on top of it and it's like, okay, yeah, let's see. It's true. Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> so I took some notes regarding this video. Um, how many of you found it to be really interesting to hear about this, right? Breaking up of the audiences. <coughs> Product. So the things that I think are the most important are this idea of horizontal segmentation. I love what he said about Grape Fruit Palm. Who remembers the famous tagline for the Grape Fruit Palm mustard? Yes. I remember the commercial, but not the tagline. Okay. Do you remember what they said in the commercial? Are they going to be Grape Fruit Palm? But of course. All right. So everything is done in the horizontal line, right? Um, the thing that I like about this is now in digital marketing, you're able to go in real time and see some of this information. Uh, first of all, when you go to your social, when you go to Yelp, you own a restaurant, do you know right away whether somebody loves your food or hates it? Yes. Yes, you yes. know right away, right? This idea of you could not used to, you used to not be able to get chunky tomato sauce. Everybody's a food critic now. So if they go to your restaurant and they don't like your Fra Diablo or whatever, they will let you know, all right? So think of your customers in terms of this horizontal line and that you have um, different types of customers that you're speaking to or targeting, okay? The other thing that I liked was this idea of three of, of the main sauce takeaways were plain sauce, people like plain, people like spicy, people like extra chunky. Identifying extra chunky alone helped them generate sixty million dollars in sales. Those six hundred million. I just read it. It was written down right. So sometimes we're afraid to kind of focus because we're like, oh no, what if I'm alienating or leaving out some of my customers? But there's a term that's like there's riches and niches. Okay, so when you focus, you can actually really attract more people and generate more sales. Um, the other thing was this idea of people didn't people don't know what they want. Like I really found that to be super true. So I often encourage people that I work with, my clients, students, and whatnot, to put together surveys and ask your customers questions for focus groups. Um, so sometimes sometimes we have to make sure we ask the right questions. And I think one of the most pivotal questions might be, how would you describe what you're looking for in your own terms? Um, again, because in this day and age, we're very used to going online and giving our opinion, rating products and saying what we love or what we hate. So just keep that in mind, okay? You might say, how did you hear about my business? What's your favorite product? But how would you describe us in your own terms? It might help you unlock something like the tomato sauce. And that was it, okay. Um, I love the idea of just once more, not assuming the universals. Traditional advertising, that's what we would do. Right? If you lived in a certain city and you made a certain amount of income and you were a certain gender, then we must speak to you in a certain way. And what we're seeing is that's not the case anymore. Right? And a prime example of that was this Time Warner ad. Uh, remember, they had that universal truth that all of our customers must hate us and be upset with our wait times. Therefore, let's advertise that. And most of us were just like, wow. Generally speaking, yes, that's the consensus about your brand, but not necessarily the best universal truth to try to 
identify or connect with as far as a marketing standpoint. So, to that point, we segment results to gain context, okay? Um, where do you go to start segmenting? I just mentioned this, your database, your existing customers and contacts, the tools that you can use to segment. If you MailChimp, we know you can now export MailChimp, and we would look at maybe customers who opened the email versus customers who didn't open the email, customers who clicked through, right? <coughs> What was another thing that we talked about in MailChimp being able to segment? I'll give you a clue too. It specifically had to do with one customer lives in one region of the United States and one customer lives in another region. Location, right? Geography, all right? Um, so email marketing tools, your e-commerce management, a few of you that have e-commerce have said, what is your shopping cart telling you? Where are your customers based upon your shopping cart? What are your top selling products, okay? Uh, process, action preference, so what that means is you know, ultimately how are people responding to the sales of your products, your conversion funnel, which we'll get into tonight, results versus goals, so we started to see that with our presentations, my goal and my KPIs are this, but here's what my actual results will be. Um, source, we looked at that in Google Analytics last week, okay, what are the top channels? That our customers are coming from. Um, what about keywords? Where are customers? What are they typing in to actually find us? And what social sites are actually referring traffic? And I love the the Fairmont example. If you guys remember from the video, they had said, "Well, you know, European customers. I think it was really responded to our content on Facebook, and it was Facebook that drove them back to our website." But for our US based customers, who remembers the social network it was that drove them back? Say it like the Twitter that drove back all the traffic. Okay. Time of day. Um, somebody had asked, well, how do I know what's the best time of day to send out my email newsletters and all of that? You will start to be able to get a feel for your customers and your audience in this segment once you start sending them out. Past campaigns. Um, so again, for those of you that have had historical data, rather than looking up all these benchmarks and things that are a little bit more um, theory-based, how do you go back to your existing data and see what picture it's telling you, okay? You're able to start figuring out with Brighton last week, like a little bit of uh, segmentation from who clicked through, who didn't, but why. And then last but not least, revenue. So how many of you on my e-commerce side know what your top performing products are? Okay, Mark, so how do you know typically, what are, are you looking at top three, top five, like how have you been able to identify what those top products are? Sure, the report function, okay. And typically... Give us a great example, right? So, you know. As a marketer, do you think that he wants to go back and try to sell, manufacture and sell more of the products that are the top performers? Or do you, are you looking at the products that aren't moving to try to sell more of those? This isn't a trick question, I'm just... Um, we try to push the other products, so we try to push the other products, so we sometimes do that as an incentive. If you get this one for free, if you go to shop for more products, try to out more so I love this example because there are probably a segment of people 
who are going to buy regardless of whether they have the incentive or not, right? But then there are a couple people in the database or who come across this website who will only buy the popular product because they would get something else for free, all right? And then there may even be a segment of people who might say, hey, I want free shipping regardless of what my product is. So that's this idea of this horizontal line, okay, and how you do that by revenue, product type, et cetera. So moving forward, um, knowing what to segment, obviously it's pretty clear that segmenting makes your data insightful, right? Will you be able to use this particular segment to personalize a campaign? That's what we're working on with you right now, right? Making this personalized, not broad and generic, but really focused. Are your metrics triangulated? Um, which means, are you using raw numbers in combination with grades and averages? Being able to say, I want to grow my sales by $10,000 is that raw number. Being able to say, I want to grow my website traffic by 20% is an example of an average, okay? Are the results statistically significant? We're going to talk about this in classes to come, especially with regard to baby testing. There is science behind this, and there is a calculator that allows you to test the significant, the statistical significance of your campaigns. Miles Eyes is like, what? Cool. I see the wheels turning. All right. And then ultimately, you know, one of the questions that we want to ask ourselves with regard to segmenting. How confident are you that you will continue to see different long-term response rates? Okay, so Bilal talked about this last class. Implicit data versus explicit data. Implicit, just to remind you again, is where your customers spending most of their time on your site. What ad channel did they come from? What actions did they or didn't they take? Including what did they purchase or didn't purchase? Or what did they, did they sign up for your form or your newsletter list or abandon? And then what did they share to social? Our explicit is what? Sure, sure. So it says your email address, name, zip code, demographic. Again, implicit what they do. So as Bilal said, it's like what we're able to kind of see spying on them. Um, explicit what they tell us, okay? So starting to help make this more clear for those of you that were like, what is the segmentation stuff? I'm a little confused. Okay. Um, so ultimately, again, this is e-commerce specific, but there's ways that you can look at your, e your email information with your e-commerce data. Obviously, the first name and last name of your customer, their email address, what, where, who, like how did they get there, okay? Your lead source, contact type, I and mean, then ultimately, where are they in the sales process and which product? So for my B2B people, I will help break down this for you with regard to starting to segment your database as well. Um, typically, you'll probably be looking at name, email, uh, open rates, industry, okay, and things of that nature, right? Type of business that they have. So segmenting with Google Analytics, I'm actually going to have you guys watch this video on your own, since we've got 55 minutes left to get through the slides, um, from Kissmetrics, and they'll explain how they were able to use Google Analytics to start segmenting, okay? Why do we segment? This idea of attribution, right? Trying to figure out where people are coming from on the web, and again, this is a little bit more agency level stuff that we're getting into, but it's just helpful to know in the event that some consultant comes in and says, I want to help you with your e-commerce sales or with your lead generation. Let me talk to you about my attribution method. So you're not like, what is this person saying to me? Okay. Um, we look at segments that tell us who our best customers are. How do we define who our best customers are? They are low cost to acquire, yet they give us the highest return on investment. Okay. Best customer, low cost to acquire, highest return on investment. Worst customers, high cost, low return on investment. Uh, as you can see, I have a little bit of like a cringe with this because of what I shared with you with regards to Starbucks. You remember that Starbucks story and they said, ooh, these people with their $2 purchases on the app, you know, they're high cost to us, we're getting low return on investment, therefore, we're going to nail you them. They were really loyal customers. So in this case, 
Worst customers could be maybe from the e-commerce standpoint, a customer that buys, that wants to buy in bulk but at the lowest price possible. You're not even making any margin or any profit. Okay. Um, from my B2B people, worst customer would be somebody who, Stephanie, tell us what they would be. They're so needy, like calling you, wanting to have extra contact with you, like not respecting boundaries. Yes, they agree to pay a certain rate for a certain amount of time, and before you know it, they're like, wait a second, you need to be my therapist, you need to be my best friend, you know, my business is falling apart, and I need to help me book a vacation, and you're like, what? No, okay. Um, which segments are the most profitable? So we have starting to get into this with regard to writing Google Analytics and looking at time spent on site, looking at, you know, you start to figure out where are people coming from who are actually spending money. It may not always be the top users, but we can break this information down. Which segments are the most profitable? Which segments are losing money? That might be a service or a product that you provide that you continually market, but it's just not converting. It's not working for you anymore. Which segments need help? And which segments are most viral? Those last two, optional for you to pursue if you'd like. Okay. Conversion funnel. How many of you have ever heard the term conversion funnel before? Okay, so for those of us who aren't familiar with it, I imagine you work with a lot of conversion funnels all so Break this down with the definition or latest terms explanation of the conversion funnel. Um, how people become customers. So okay. So the conversion funnel can show you how people become customers. Who wants to add to what it does, right? Um, start off with people seeing, being aware that this exists. Some people that you know, have to come in, some people that check back in. Right. Is that infographic? Is that, yeah, slide. you hit the nail on the head. It's that graphic. Now, I will say that there's some theory that was shifting away from this. However, remember I told you that whether you have the internet today or tomorrow, understanding the basic fundamentals of marketing would always be for your best interest. This is a basic fundamental of marketing, okay? that you have to reach a wide amount of people okay ultimately some sort of action takes place here or like let's just say they visit the website let's assume that they leave the next day they go back on their computer all of a sudden they see your Twitter post It drives them back to your website, and now they execute a certain action, okay? So it's this idea of there being multi-steps and multi-channels before somebody buys your product or your service, okay? Yes, yes. This is the same thing as like a sales funnel. This is different than a sales funnel. A sales funnel where you have like you know an entry level price of a product that leads into like a two hundred fifty dollar product. And then mm, sales funnel might help you with lifetime value. So we'll get into that, right? We'll get into yeah. As far as like the dictionary's definition, conversion funnel. Who wants to read what conversion funnel is? Wow. Miles. Uh, conversion bundle is used to describe the track of how consumer takes through an internet advertising or search system to navigate the e-commerce website and finally convert to the same. And let's replace e-commerce with navigating a website. Okay, I apologize that for general assembly purposes, we do have a lot of e-commerce, you know, business owners in here, but it's generally a website that converts to a sale or ultimate acquisition. Okay. So why do we track this, right? This goes back to what we were saying. Um, there's multiple ways that somebody buys your product that gets to it. Um, ultimately, we can say here in this pretty old school version that someone's coming in through, you know, this podium extension, if you will. There's 
the cart, there's the form, there's the confirmation page, and finally, they get this thank you page, okay? So, remember, with regard to e-commerce, just because somebody put something in the shopping cart, does that mean they become a customer, right? No, all right? You put the product in the shopping cart, and then what do you have to do? You have to tell the software what your name is, your billing address, where it's getting shipped, okay? And here's my credit card information. Believe it or not, for some people that's a lot of steps and they'll just be like, oh forget this, I don't wanna spend the money anyway, all right? So this idea of this conversion funnel from an e-commerce standpoint is saying, put it in the cart, fill out the form, you get the confirmation page, you get the thank you page, all right, you've gotten them actually to become a customer, okay? And we'll set up various types of conversion funnels for you. Um, more importantly, there's a whole series of funnels that happen before we get them in the cart, which is this example here, okay? So conversion funnels, uh, visualize your customer's experience towards completing a goal or purchase. Add segments in Google Analytics, which we'll explain how to do to filter results and review. Determine which steps your customers take to take a closer look at where there might be an opportunity to optimize. Um, compare channel performance using goals and attribution review. I would say the second one was what we were doing the other day with Brighton's Google Analytics. Really going in there and being able to say who's visited this site, um, and according to who's visited this site, demographically speaking, her business is located in what state? Her business is physically located. But we saw that she had all this traffic and highly engaged traffic from Pennsylvania, okay? So it started to tell us a story with regard to a potential customer segment that we could, through a campaign, strive to convert, right? Are you guys all with me? Yes, okay. Tracking, again, just to repeat, tracking will help us know where, digital, where users come from, which channels, campaigns, and ads resonate the most. Once we know, the platforms that resonate the most, the email creative that resonates the most, et cetera, where to optimize your efforts, okay? And then ultimately, how to better allocate budget. So how many of you currently have a little bit of a budget for Facebook marketing, okay? How many of you have a budget for something else that you use from a marketing standpoint? Okay, what are you using else-wise? Okay. Sure. Trade shows, so being in like the directories for trade shows and things. And then Katie, what would you say you, you use budget for? We use budget for a lot of photographers, so we do a lot of original content. So we have a place in the budget for that, um, so that we can use it for email marketing, Instagram, Facebook ads. Sure. Perfect. So ultimately, what what I like about the examples that you're show, you're sharing with us is, with your final project campaigns, I'll keep in mind you'll want you'll need to actually try a couple different attempts. You're going to set a budget for these things, and you'll be able to say. This Facebook ad campaign cost me this much money, it generated this much ROI, how does it compare to what we've done with LA Showroom, right? Or how might we optimize it, which is the key here, okay? It takes money to make money, right? So we need to figure out how to gradually increase your marketing budgets. Some of our students in the last class, guess what their marketing budget was? Zero, okay? So we're gonna go through in our budgeting class how you start to figure out what your marketing budget hypothetically could be based upon some calculations that exist industry standard wise, and then how to better allocate budget. Um, because our consumers are coming from multi channels, right? Some offline, some online. We want to make sure that you at least keep top of mind um, in the various places that your customers may be. So, Google Analytics. Um, we're going to set up the Google URL Builder. How many of you guys actually took a look at that link? Okay. 
Um, what that will allow us to do, as I've told you, now that you're going to be introduced to it, you'll start to see it actually used a lot more. And remember from class on Monday, Bilal and I mentioned this idea of a UTM code. UTM, we're going to get into that. Um, these links allow us to say, hey, we're going to put an ad up on Facebook. We're actually going to put two ads up, and we're going to A-B test them. Besides the analytics that Facebook gets us, how else would we know the effectiveness of those ads? Looking in Google Analytics, under click-through rates or referral sources, okay? Um, so we would use these campaign tags and custom URLs to be able to determine that. True story, I had a student email me on Monday who ran a Facebook ad. Sorry, Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg, if you guys are listening. Sometimes their reporting side is very wonky. What I mean by that is my student told me, I have a tracking pixel on my Facebook ad. It says I generated this many clicks. It's like 4,000, 5,000 clicks, but I only drove 2,000 visits to my website, and of that, only 90 people did what I wanted them to do. And her question to me was, does this seem off? So I said, send me your website. Let me take a look at it. Did you have Google Analytics set up? And she said, no. Okay? So we're trying to just cover both your bases here when you start spending money on email marketing, Facebook ads, AdWords in Google if you're going to use that, um, even using sharing content on social, being able to tell you precisely in your Google Analytics what has occurred as a result of sharing these links. I think looking at a visual will really help, okay? Um, so ultimately, with regard to Fila in particular, who remembers what the Fila brand is? Yes. What was, I can't even remember, what, is Fila an acronym for anything or it's just an Italian brand, right? Who knows? Oh my gosh, who wants to Google what Fila's origin is? This is a problem. And what kind of put them on the map would you guys say if you could remember what product or? Oh, it's a shoe. Italy. Tennis shoe. Tennis shoe. shoe. Okay. Well, how funny that you should say that, Molly, because here, Fila says to set up this, I, this idea of campaign tags. They don't want to just push people back to Fila.com. They want to focus specifically on what? Fila.com tennis, okay? Now, ultimately, we can see that their campaign source, where are they looking to put a particular link to measure, right? They're looking to share a link on Facebook. We know that because what do we see here? Facebook, okay? By nature or by classification, Facebook is a social networking platform, right? So they put here Facebook social, and then what is the name of their campaign that they're trying to test the effectiveness of their Facebook traffic? All right, why is that important? How many sales do you think they have throughout the year? Multiple, right? So in particular, by putting this particular link, what would have normally been fila.com forward slash tennis, they're now customizing it to say fila.com forward slash tennis, and there's a way that they're going to say to Google Analytics, Facebook social spring sale. All right? Spring sale the date too. Yes. So unfortunately, we don't have an example of that. We will get an example of this for Warby Parker, okay? Warby, am I pronouncing it correctly? Warby Parker, all right? Here, what are we looking at theoretically? Does everybody agree that this looks like maybe an advertisement from something? Okay. It's probably not a Facebook ad because we don't see like, um, but maybe this is a Google ad, right? And what does this arrow indicate is happening once we actually engage with the ads? Yes. Yes. You're clicking through, right, to where? Their website. Okay. So how will they know this? Here's an example of what we have on the next page, this idea of the tag slash custom URL builder. 
Before, it would have just been www.warbyparker.com forward slash men, optical, Linwood revolver, black, M question mark, okay? Now, because we have source, we'll have medium and we'll have campaign, we'll know whether that was a Google ad or a Facebook ad or an ad on a blog, right? Display ad, so, and we'll know whether that was a campaign for spring, summer, fall, healthy eye day, all right? We're gonna actually walk you guys through how to set this up, okay? So let me just go through this one more time. So what is it saying? It's saying that, it's from, that they were on a style blog, and then... It could be. Flipped. What was the next? So, just like theoretically... Just reading your own link that you saw. Theoretically, um, Let's pretend that this was a, what do you want to be a Facebook ad, a display ad on a fashion blog, or do you want it to be a Google ad? Which one? Facebook. Okay. Facebook. So let's go back to this example we had before. Campaign source will be what? Now, if we're sticking with this model, what's our medium? Facebook is what? And let's make up a campaign for Warby Parker. What do you think this campaign is? What does the creative say? Sure, Linwood, great idea. Okay, so now on this next slide, we're able to see traffic that would come from link two because in the link, this is a back end thing, all right? It would be warbyparker.com, UTM source, what would be there in that actual link if we were to actually see it? Facebook, what would the medium be? And what would the campaign be? And it says, it even has Linwood promo, but sale maybe, right? Linwood promo. If it was Google ads, what would be the source? Google ads. Google ads and the Google. Search, Google, yeah. Did you make that up? Yes. That? Oh, okay. Yes. That's where we're going with this. I'll show you where you make it up and where you actually start to look for it and track it. Okay. So URL builder. That's the tool that we're, we're looking for. The first step I think that's going to make this helpful for everybody is I want you to take two minutes or so, one to two minutes, to pull a link that you would like to try to, to create one of these custom tag links for. That link could be your homepage, okay? That link could be a shopping cart on your website. That link could be a specific product, all right? Is that the website? No. Start with your website. We're trying to track traffic back to your website, okay? Take a minute to pull a link from your website. It could be a blog post, all right? Or if you don't have a website, any website. Sure, any website. Your pretend dream business that you'd love to be the CEO of someday. Amazon. It's not recommended per se, really. Yeah, I mean, it can interfere with the tracking. Google has a... Does everybody have a link or you need another 30 seconds or so? Okay. There's another step I need to do, so. Sure, pick one blog post. One blog post for them. Yes, because why? Where are they competing with? Curator, yeah. Does everybody have their link? <coughs> Raise your hand if you have your link already. Raise them high so I can see. Kelly? I don't. I haven't set up. Oh, no, no, just pick a link of anything. For in oh. Pick a website that you glam, uh, not glam, girl boss. Okay. Right? Who, who needs a link? Katie M, number one. Do you have a link? Uh, I have, yeah. 1111? 
I sew, Katie. Yeah. Okay, everybody has a link? Mm -hmm. Now, the second step in this is where are you going to share this link? I'm gonna give you some options. Do you wanna share this link in your email newsletter? Do you wanna share this link on your Facebook page? Do you wanna share this link on a Facebook ad? Okay, do you wanna share this link on Twitter? Take a minute now just to pick the first thing that comes to your mind for the purposes of the exercise with regard to where you're gonna share this link. Okay? Facebook, that's it. You say Facebook. Facebook page or Facebook ad. Okay? That's what I wanted a Facebook page or Facebook ad. Everybody have where they're gonna share their link? So what do we do? We just go to Facebook ad? No, no, no. Oh. We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay. Name of the campaign. Right? Name of the campaign. Could be GGM Final Project Campaign. Adoption campaign, whatever the name of the campaign would be. You're gonna say sign your ass up campaign. <laughs> Everybody have your name of the campaign? Okay. So, to refresh your memory, the Google URL builder basically gives you some boxes to fill this information in, right? You guys will have a chance to actually fill this in. Let's walk through it really quickly as a class, okay? What goes in here? Based upon this exercise you just did, what are you putting here? The URL that you just picked, okay? So when you look at the Google URL custom builder, the URL that you just picked goes into this box right here, okay? What is the next thing we need to fill in? Campaign source. Now, to Rob's question, we're saying that whatever source you choose or chose, that is what you're using to distribute that content, okay? You're going to create limited reader that one more time. Whatever so source you chose is where you're using to distribute that content. Grace, what did you choose as a source? Email. Perfect. Okay. So she wants to be able to track the traffic from her email marketing for this particular blog campaign. Okay. Give me another source that somebody chose. Facebook ad. Okay. Who chose Facebook page? See the difference of why we put this? If you, according to Google Analytics, unless you do this, it will not know how to differentiate between a Facebook ad that sends you traffic versus a Facebook page that sends you traffic versus a personal Facebook profile that sends you traffic. Okay? Um, what about medium? Email, so email could be email, right? Pretty much straightforward. Um, Facebook, social, okay. Anybody put Google, like AdWords? You can put social advertising or... It's whatever helps you. This is, this is subjective, okay? It's whatever helps you keep track of your stuff. I would say the most important thing is this idea of the campaign name and making sure that there's some indication of the date, the year. There's nothing worse than trying to go back and pull this data moving forward and being like, oh my gosh, was this from last year? Was this from last month? Was this from last week? Okay? Alex? We've gone over the part of the importance of the A-B testing. You have two different ads that you're running on Facebook right now, and you want to see which one is going to work better. This is going to be the way that you're going to be able to track this, because one of those ads you will have It'll be the same to begin with. It's, hey, it's Facebook, it's social, but when you get into the campaign part, it's going to be like, hey, this is this particular ad which has an emotional approach versus this particular ad which has a rational approach. You'll then be able to go back into your Google Analytics and be able to show, like, oh wow, my one with the emotional approach worked 10 times better than my one with the analytical or with the rational approach. And let me clarify that. Because 
What doesn't change is the URL. So how many of you picked a URL that was promoting a product? Raise your hands. Okay. So to his point, you could try one approach if you're testing, A-B testing as an emotional approach for selling that product or a logical approach for selling that product. We want you to feel sexy versus save $50, okay? The link doesn't change. Well, what changes could be Facebook ad, rather than social, you could put in feel good, sexy, 50% off, okay? And that way you're able to look in your Google Analytics which of them drove more traffic and helped you with more sales. All right, is that clear? So you from an A-B testing standpoint. So you make two of these, basically. If you're A-B testing, if you're not A-B testing, creating this will just start to allow you to track whether email or Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest or whatever drives more traffic back to your site, okay? But if you're promoting, let's say, a product and promoting this town, uh, the URL will be different on that website. Because in order to go to a discount, you have the URL has to be discount. You know, you won't be the same page. Not necessarily. You can put a discount code. So for, there's a lot of different ways that we can get around that. You might even push people to a landing page, right? So, you know, we'll take this and we'll continue to advance upon this. How many of you have actually ever seen this before, much less set this up? Right? Raise your hands if you've seen this before and set this up. Okay? So what, what, is, what have you been using to help track with this set? I haven't actually done it, but we did it for Apple. For what? Apple. Apple Tracker Apple. Okay. All right. Um, ultimately, like I said, how extensive we get with this, we will continue to build upon. So, in some cases, if the URL that you're choosing, to Haran's point, may not even be the product, it might be a landing page where you have a specific promotion. And the purpose of the landing page is solely to get that customer to check out, fill out the form, buy one product, as opposed to navigate your site and buy multiple. Okay? Yes. As a service-based business owner, we'd be could the campaign source be like a specific email list? So if you're basically going after one list and then another and another, so you can just create one for each. Yes. For my B2B people, what this might look like are even different audiences. Okay, so for Miles, it could be like lawyers, finance. For one of the back, it could be content, right? People who want checklists, people who want recipes, testing different content, all right? There's a variety of different ways. But the key is that up until, let me tell you, last August, I didn't even know that this existed. All right? So it's really, really, really powerful once you start using it. Okay? Um, so ultimately, yes? Can you put it more than one source in the source field? Or is it one just yet? Just for every source. Yeah, you got to make it different for every source. That's what I'm saying. If you're going to put, so again, with regard to Facebook in particular, because Facebook is so popular, how many of you have the tendency to maybe share what you're working on or your products or services on your personal page? I do from time to time, right? And then do you also share the information to your Facebook page, like the business page? And then you add another layer onto this now when we start figuring in Facebook ads, okay? If we were to do all three of those things, Without this URL tracking, Google Analytics is just going to tell us you've got traffic from Facebook. And in theory, the Facebook ad insights would say, we push this many people here. But it's software. So sometimes it's not 100% accurate. So having both your bases covered is what allows us to say, OK, let's try to pull this as much as possible. This is my question. So the URL builder that comes up at the bottom of our, is that we're doing the Facebook ad, is that what we do you use this for Facebook ads? Do you use this? Wait. So if I, if I specifically put one for a Facebook ad. We're going to do Facebook on Monday, and I'm going to walk you guys through how you create your ad yeah. in here, and then you go into the actual Facebook application. If This is why I don't want to get into this tonight. In a Facebook ad, you have a lot of different actions that we could choose. Okay. Some people want to have a Facebook ad to help you get more likes to your page. Some people want to run a Facebook ad and help you use more posts. 
Most of us run Facebook ads to push traffic back where? <coughs> to our website, okay? And that was where you would put this custom URL to help track that. You're going to get to that on Monday, okay? So if the campaigns work with email, does it have to be like an active link? You just put... You're, this does become an active link. Yes, this does become an active link. So what would happen is you would then... You come up with a blog post that you want to email out to your subscribers, okay? Simultaneous, you also want to tweet this blog post out, all right? You create two different links. One, you put email campaign, blah, 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 blah. The other, you say Twitter. And you share them both, okay? Does that help make sense? So you take the link that you get for email, and that actually goes inside your email, all right? And then you take the link that you get for Twitter, and that goes on your Twitter profile and gets distributed out. Okay? You guys are doing awesome considering this is like new, and the best way you're going to learn this is by actually plugging in your URLs, okay? But we have to crawl before we walk, so I want to make sure that you understand the steps and the how, and then you can start plugging away with it, right? Because as you've seen, there's a lot of different ways that we can do this. The more specific that you can be, the better your offer, better off going to be. So anybody who shops online, if you say, oh, I want an onion, you need to say, oh, I want this type of onion. I want green onions from California. I want whatever, so that you can actually specifically focus on what it is that you're looking for. And it's the same thing for this. The most specific you can be, the date that you send it out, the campaign you're doing it, then Google Analytics will allow you to be like, all right, I want to see how this did. So here's an example, right, of some actual tracking in the back end. Of these examples that we have here, which of these is probably the most clear? Which of the, that tells you what's kind of like going on and where it's from? 717. <coughs> okay. So what might we assume about ClarkHoward.com slash referral? Someone went to that website and then on that website. Yes. So maybe Clark Howard wrote about the business. Maybe we did a guest blog post for Clark Howard. Is that the most clear indication of what was going on? No, right? Um, is there another one that could be a little bit clearer? Number nine. What does number nine say? Sure. Okay, so what might this tell us about this particular business if we see University of Virginia and Campus Ambassadors? Who might they be targeting? College students. College students. Okay. Sure. And we see that with Colgate and we see that with University of Virginia. Now, in theory, if you were to click on eight and nine, the link would, ex it would open up, as the link says, and you can see the link. So we get some more context and information, but that's why it's important you know, to specify in here what's going on, okay? Or like what you're trying to track. So again, um, Stephanie had a question that I'm not sure many of you heard. How many of you have ever used a URL shortener before? Super popular for now email, Facebook. It used to be that they were popular for Twitter because of the character count. But so this bit.ly URL shortener, which I love, I've been told can compromise the reporting data when you're kind of trying to set up these UTM codes. So we'll send you the Alex saying Google has their own URL shortener. Uh, we'll help you take that, I will say ugly, but pretty lengthy URL and figure out a way to make it shorter so that your consumer doesn't, your, your potential client, customer, whatever, doesn't get overwhelmed with this long URL, especially if you're sharing it on social, okay, particularly Twitter, all right? Oh, I hadn't heard that episode. It doesn't surprise me. So, so it's not the, yeah, it hacking plays a role because if you don't change it, what happens is that, I mean, what, that, that what, the, what happens is that if your sources are there, basically it's telling you what files you have, so the hacker will know in what files to get directly 
comes in here and then changes it around. So that's why you change the URL, like shoes, whatever it is, this black, and then so it becomes black. Okay, interesting. The other thing, too, is that whether the URL is short or long, again, um, if you guys go on like news sites or like I said, if you go, if you go on um, even display ads, right? So if you go to like ktla.com or cnn.com, and an ad will pop up. If you click on that and you look at the bottom, you there's going to be a script that runs, meaning you'll see the URL. It'll change and it'll say CNN, you know, UTM, like all the stuff that we're outlining here. All right, so this is going to become more and more common. Like I said, you won't be able to escape knowing what a UTM code looks like now that you've seen it. All right, we're already taking our break. So just rounding this out, like why is this, why is it important to start to also be able to track uh, where people are coming from? Familiar customer versus unfamiliar customer. The reason why I keep bringing this up is because that unfamiliar customer went through couple of different steps to actually purchase the product. First, they saw a Facebook ad, okay? Do you think that the marketers who were marketing to that unfamiliar customer had one of these custom URLs to help them determine that? Yeah, right? Second, that familiar customer went from the Facebook ad to the website, okay? How did they know that? Again, URL tracking, all right? After that unfamiliar customer went to the website, they left and they got retargeted. So for those of you who might be interested in retargeting, you use this same theory, okay, to try to get your people back. And then ultimately they created, they, they finally fulfilled their purchase. This process, if we were to look at it and say, this customer didn't just come from being retargeted to that very last interaction. This customer went through a series of step, steps. The scientific term for that process is called attribution. Okay? Attribution. The reason why we cover this in General Assembly is because if you were at an agency, you would be looking at attribution models. Like I said, for my small business owners, it's just good to know that this exists. Um, Attribution is the science of assigning credit or allocating dollars from a sale to the marketing touch point that a customer was exposed to prior to their purchase. Okay. How about if the customer goes to a website and then from that website goes to another one, and then from that another one goes to yours and doesn't purchase? So what's the What doesn't purchase it? It will only tell you if they purchase. Yeah, or complete a goal. Okay. So. Let me go through, um, let's watch this video is way too long. There's a shorter version of this video. I believe we may have already posted this previously in Schoology. Okay, it was like a five or six minute long video where he explains that the analogy he gives his attribution is like, yes, turnover. He, he, not, he gives it to like a basketball game analogy or whatever. Short video that we'll share with you guys to watch over the weekend, okay, um, to understand how this works better. Remember this, this is what we were talking about, that there's a variety of different ways that people get to your site and attribution helps us figure out what those ways may be, okay? Most of us are gonna be dealing with customers who hear about us or find us on social, right? Brand awareness. Ultimately, we want that customer to subscribe to our email newsletter. Based upon what we learned about email on Monday, what would happen then if they received a few emails from us, ideally based upon the, the statistics of email marketing? You would want that customer to potentially purchase, okay? So this idea of attribution will help us start to track this. Now there's a variety of different attribution models. I apologize for the weird sizing, I just want to go through these with you really quickly. The first one is called what? The last interaction. That means that Google Analytics attributes 100% of the value to the last channel before the conversion or the sale occurred. By conversion, that could mean that somebody signed up for your email newsletter, 
they, you know, watch the video, all right, um, sale, obviously that's pretty straightforward. It's a great baseline for comparison with other models, okay? Google Analytics automatically assigns this as it is right now. But some people say, you know, I really want to know how somebody first found my website, okay, and became a customer or a subscriber. So what's the next type of attribution model that we have? First interaction. First interaction. The first interaction model can help you understand which campaigns create initial awareness for your brand or for your product. So if you're running Google ads versus Facebook ads, you would want to say, hey, was it Google ads that drove more traffic or Facebook ads on a first interaction basis, okay? What's the next one that we have? Linear. The linear model might be used if your campaigns are designed to maintain contact and awareness with the customer throughout the entire sales cycle. My B2B people, does this sound familiar to you? Right? Drip campaign, okay? If you guys remember when I showed you that little diagram with regard to email on Monday, why it's important to have some sort of like trigger series set up, all right? This linear model helps us explain why, because you want to keep those like interactions and touch points going with the customer or the potential customer, not just waiting for them to get your newsletter or whatever the case may be. Um, what's the next one? Position-based model. A position-based model can be used to adjust credit for different parts of the customer's journey, such as early interactions that create awareness or late interactions that close sales. Rounding us out, we have the last one, which is what? The time decay. Time decay model assigns the most credit to the touch points that occurred nearest to the time of the conversion. It can be useful for campaigns with short sales cycles, such as promotions. All right? Based upon these five examples that we're looking at, take a minute to think about what might work for you and for your business in your final project campaign, okay? Thoughts. Who thinks last interaction? Raise your hand. Raise them high. Who thinks first interaction would be what they would want to track for their campaign? Linear. For attribution. If you were to set up an attribution model for your final project campaign, which would you pick, Molly? Linear. Okay, so linear people, raise your hands. Position based. Time decay. Okay, cool. Um, next class, if you want, I'll take a couple more minutes before we start with regard to why you picked the attribution model you did. So think about that and be prepared to share. So just rounding out this idea of attribution modeling, no one model is going to give you all of the story, okay? It's the software that we're dealing with. There are some flaws, if you will, um, but ultimately, you know, you're familiar with these various types of models, and like I said, Google Analytics defaults to the last interaction, but it's helpful to know the choices that you have, right? And this idea that if you wanted to do paid, perhaps you'd switch to first interaction, um, maybe you'd stick with linear, whatever the case may be. Experiment and layer in custom models. So for lab on Monday, if you get here at 6.30, I'm gonna show you how Google Analytics actually has attribution models that other Google Analytics users have filled in um, and created. So there's other ones besides what we're looking at here, but no need to go crazy with all of this. Um, I just think even comprehending what's going on is very, very, very powerful. Would you guys agree? Having not known this maybe previously four weeks ago to knowing it now? Okay. Um, rounding this out, so if you don't have e-commerce, what we set up in Google Analytics are goals. We will get to that. We are going there, okay? Um, obviously, we want to go back to this idea, is what is, this idea of what is our marketing goal? Is it branding slash awareness? 
Is it lead generation? Is it the direct acquisition of a new customer, meaning you're going to target people who will buy on your site that day? Okay. Are you looking to retarget and maybe get a repeat customer? Or are you looking to test and see popular content? Again, Fairmont, now that we know this idea of attribution model, they used Google Analytics to test what? Content, remember? Look at multi-channel funnels. How are channels and campaigns working to meet goals? We're gonna start to get into this, okay? Pick a base model, we've already done that, right? So I want you to think about over the weekend why you might choose to look at the model that you're looking at and be prepared to share. Um, Look for big chances and percentages or values. So does a certain key or display ads show low value on last click but come up big on first? We're going to get into display advertising after midterm, so I'll remind you guys of this question so we can review it again. And are attributions in line for your spend per channel? We're going to get to spend with regard to budgeting and whatnot in the weeks to come. So. When we actually start to touch on this idea of display ads, budgeting and all that, we're gonna get into this, using Google Analytics to measure attribution. What I wanted to really make sure you understood tonight was one, segmentation, okay? How none of our customers need to necessarily be marketed to the same. There's this idea of segments. Two, this idea of Google Custom URL Builder Social networks in and of themselves are segments. How many of you actually love Twitter and use it frequently? How many of you love Instagram and use it frequently? How many of you love Facebook and use it frequently? Love that. How many of you love Pinterest and use it frequently? Okay, social networks in and of themselves are segments. <laughs> yes, okay. So we're gonna to start to get into this idea of measuring this kind of stuff and being able to set budgets, all right? That's in the least to come. Um, customer journey recap, this is just sort of like reiterating these charts that we've seen. You know, unfamiliar customer might click on a display ad, see some social, conduct some generic paid search, Theoretically conduct some organic search. There's a lot of things that could occur for a customer to ultimately get to your website All right, um, and this tells you here the last interaction Typically is like direct to the shopping cart. Okay more often the assist interactions are these things that we're seeing to the left here display click on an ad social networking Conducting an organic search to get to a website conducting a paid search to get to a website being referred by the blog, what was that gentleman's name? Clark Kennedy, whatever, dot com. Um, opening up an email, okay? We're gonna get to this. Putting it all together, we'll get to. What did we learn today? How many of you are like, it is Wednesday night, I'm ready to fill all my eggs and ticket and go home? Okay, it's a lot of information. Give yourselves a round of applause for getting through it. Just to recap, what we covered tonight, what we covered, that's a very critical word, okay? What we covered, because we're going to continue to learn. This is not the only time you're gonna see this information. The importance of segmenting and how to use marketing analytics to segment and target customers, yes? All right, tracking customer behavior across multiple step conversions. We covered that. We're going to learn how to do that continuously from now through the next five weeks. Understand the difference between basic attribution models. What's first click going to tell you? First, first impression, right? What about last? Linear. Yes, time delay, time decay. It's going to start to give you credit towards that last end of the purchase. You understood the difference between basic attribution models. All right, everybody. Please fill out your exit tickets. Again, not to cause any confusion, module eight, segmentation and tracking. We're going back to nine. So yeah, it's eight. 
Eight. Yeah, I, we switched because, like I said, I want you guys to have some time to review some Facebook tools. Facebook is going to be both Facebook and Instagram. Part of the issue is that, huh? It is eight. Just because I, I, I have free reign to switch around the syllabus however I want. I did want to share that this was supposed to be lesson five originally. How would you guys have felt about, yeah, oh, I see some faces. So that's how much I love you, all my students. They gave me the syllabus a couple cohorts ago, and they were like, here's this number, this is this, and this is lesson five. And I was like, Yes, I love hearing that. Thank you. By the way, too, I just want to let you know we're going to have a few more speakers as well um, between now and the end of the cohort. I think it's really great to like just, I try to bring people in and alternate, and I think it brings a certain energy to the class. So, full, full disclosure, we will have some more speakers. Um, tomorrow we will be posting what your deliverables are. All right, moving forward. And your pre-reads. We've got some volunteers for Monday. Everybody else, if you have not volunteered to present your decks and stuff, this is for your benefit. Okay, it's to help you. I think everybody who went today got some really great value out of it, so you're all gonna do it. Thank you guys so much for an awesome week. And if you have any requests for treats next week, let me know. We will. We'll actually have dinner Wednesday. GA will provide us because it's midterm night some food. I will find out what kind of food we'll have. Yes, you're going to have a midterm test. Open book groups. And I'll give you guys your groups over the weekend too. Open book groups.
So food for thought was that eventually down the line when the operation is warranted, they can send a pallet of product so that they'll need to have some sort of distribution center in the United States, right? And then for now, we're like, maybe we go to Target, um, Qatar, Dubai, right? And places where not a big difference. Say $100. I just said uh, you're number one. I mean, it's just like, you can just send it here now. And just like, you know, it's only been for two months. Oh, JK. Okay. Uh, so that's what we're trying to think about. Oh, it's a base here. Her campaign, like where yeah. she should target. She has traffic coming from uh, Europe, like the uh, UK, Germany, France, south of France. Okay. But this shipping thing, I told her it's a good problem to have now, right. and you don't have any customers right, right now, versus right. trying to figure out when you get a customer. Yeah. But, you but just have to, I mean, try and target your items towards a specific demographic you can afford to send to. You know? Like, really focus on, like, what people in the UAE, like, try and target towards them, because then you don't have to, like, send this far. I don't know. So you're saying, is that just for a single suit? It's $100, $200 uh, for shipping? Yeah. You're sending one suit. Just one suit. Okay, so why don't you try to get maybe sending, like you said, a pallet, a bunch of suits. So you can create some wait lists and you, your bed suits go to deliver in 20 days. This is a good question for FedEx, for UPS. You should ask them and ask them to tell them the problems that they do. They love this stuff. I had that problem I never worked with FedEx or anyone. There are companies which what they do is I take longer time, but what they do is they you have a shipment from Turkey to LA, they wait till the pallet picks up and it will take around a week. And then they put that box in that pallet and they ship it and they deliver it back right away. And usually right now there's this service, for example, which they charge me just like five dollars a time. It's like there are different private shipping companies, FedEx and the HR that's a big uh, I used to I used to ship from Syria. Uh, but I used to ship in Spain. It's like I used to go to, let's say, uh, Turkish Airlines or Air Force.